I think we can all agree that 2020 was an unexpected year on so many levels. We saw a once in a century global pandemic, an economic collapse, record unemployment. We saw George Floyd and the social justice protests and riots that came about as a result. In the midst of all that, we also lived through a highly contentious presidential election. This year, I wanted to make sense of all this for myself. So I invited experts to come and talk to me. And what I've compiled are 10 of the biggest lessons and takeaways from those interviews. I hope you enjoy them. Everyone that's listening should be on vitamin D, D like dog, 5,000 to 10,000 daily with food. Vitamin D has direct antiviral um, benefits. People don't realize that. In addition to the fact that it just boosts the immune system uh, generally too. Mm -hmm. um, vitamin C, which again, most people know that helps your immune system, 1,000 with meals. Yeah. And then zinc, zinc has is like having uh it, it's time on the stage really <laughs> during all of this <laughs> because we kind of like you know we think about zinc but we don't think about zinc um right. even as a functional medicine doc we don't really think about it all that all that much until this happened because zinc right. zinc is directly antiviral and some of the medications that are being used like hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. and another supplement called quercetin they act as what we call a zinc ionophore, which means they basically open the channel so that zinc can get inside. So we think zinc is doing a lot of the work where it's actually blocking viral replication at the cellular level when it can get in there. So those, I'd say D, C, and zinc are prevention everyone should be on. And then I have a group of supplements if patients slip into the inflammatory phase of this, which includes omega-3s, so fish oil, turmeric in high doses. We do have an antiviral herb we use called monolaurin and glutathione. Glutathione is the master antioxidant. And oh. there have been, there's been some studies showing that people with worse outcomes of COVID have low levels of that master antioxidant. Uh, I think the fountain of youth is taking care of yourself. I think it's, we spend so much time taking care and not to put the dudes down, but women, especially like we're just constant like caretakers and we feel guilty. Everything we're nurturing everybody, everyone around us, but we almost feel guilty when we take time for ourselves. So for me, that fountain of youth is finding something that mm. brings you joy and happiness fixes us at Sort of a cellular level it helps our brain waves it, i mean you can look up the research it's pretty cool it's much more mainstream so for me i'm going to say yoga and finding something that brings you personal joy and taking care of yourself and not feeling guilty about it yeah. not having to lean it to anybody just and not feeling selfish. Like, I think we feel selfish if we're like, uh, I just want to take an hour to exercise. I know so many mom friends that they feel guilty taking any time for themselves. And it's really hard to let go of that. It's so necessary. It's the old, uh, put the oxygen mask on, right? Like somebody else or yourself first Absolutely. so that you can take care of everybody else. Absolutely. Like that's so true. We have, to. so fountain of youth is take care of yourself and then you can take care of the, everybody else you want to take care of. And certainly yoga and exercise and eating right are part of that. One of the best speeches ever given in the history of mankind was by Sir Winston Churchill. Mm. <laughs> that is the, commence, the commencement speech that he gave. The guy sat there for two minutes and said, never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 ever give up. That was it. And then he sat down. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like, right. It's amazing advice. <laughs> it's amazing advice. And yeah. like, it's, it's incredible. You know, other people that I've known in my life say that one of the things that they admire about me is my tenacity. And that I don't really hear the word no. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay right <laughs> like to me say no or can't that's quitter talk ever seen the movie glenn gary glenn glenn ross but there's there's a great line in it this young broker goes over and gets coffee and his sales manager is like what are you doing 
He's like, I'm getting coffee. He goes, put that down. Coffee's for closers. You're a loser. Get back. <laughs> you know, until, until you start closing deals, you don't get any coffee. <laughs> right? Coffee's for closers. Coffee's for closers. Right? That's <laughs> right? brilliant. My, my, my guys and I, you know, always make, you know, we always used to make, make that joke, right? And it's, it's incredible to me how many people give up or as my friend Michael Untermeyer point, pointed out to me when we began this journey, just mm -hmm. don't show up. If you believe in something, if you want to do something with your life, you need to pursue that avenue and do not let anyone tell you otherwise. Follow your curiosity instead of your passion. So, and the reason I say that is I received... Um, some really an awareness and wonderful advice through my favorite author, Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she was giving a talk um, where she said she used to be what she calls a passion bully, right? So she used to always tell people that trite advice of follow your passion. That's how you should find the meaning of your life or the right career, right? Follow right. your passion. We hear right. that a lot. Yes. But I think yes. a lot of people get disillusioned by that because they don't know what that is. And then they feel like a loser, right? Because right. Like, why, why I guess I don't have one, right? So she was giving a talk and she said, um, I don't say that anymore. Now I realize you just need to follow your curiosity. What mm. are you interested in? What is fascinating to you? What do you want to know more about? And just be open and be curious yeah. in the world, like a child almost. And that just might lead you to your passion. But, it's, but we put overemphasis on having this one set path and this one passion, and that's just what you got to do with your life, right? And come away from that and just have a mindset of curiosity. And that's when I really think about that, that's what got me where I am today because I had the boldness to say, well, I wonder what would happen if I started my own business. Would people sign up? Would I enjoy it? Would I be good at it? Yeah. That's curiosity. Yeah. I followed my curiosity to see if that was going to be my passion, right? And it turns out that it was. And if it hadn't been, that's okay. I think, but I think that emphasizing curiosity over passion is so much more productive and more freeing. Mm -hmm. And so that's my advice to the world. People smarter than me have said, maybe the best question to ask yourself or anyone else is, what's the one thing you're most afraid of? Mm. You know, or what's the one that you're most ashamed of that you've done in your life? Uh, because that, you know, embarrassment typically is in front of others. Yeah. Uh, but a shame or shame is more inside you. It's more internal. Right. And ultimately, the person you have to be with 24 hours a day is yourself. Right. right. And so I think you have to get back into that kind of territory. You know, what are you ashamed of? What are you afraid of? Um, you know, that, that's going to be rich territory because there, there will be something there. Yeah. You know, biggest regret. There, there, there's going to be something there in every single instance. And you may not be able to resolve it. You know, we don't get to live a perfect life. I mean, right. maybe, maybe you have, Mark, but I, I haven't quite yeah. managed it. Not at um, all. <laughs> and so I, I, that's rich territory and that's homework yeah. worth doing. Um, mm -hmm. and you maybe can't do it every hour of every day because it's right. going to be painful work. Right. But even a little bit of it, even, even one, one, you know, spadeful, uh, yeah. out of the garden of that work might, might, uh, right. you know, might be a bumper crop someday down the road. I mean, I'm, I'm just now somewhat feeling normal after moving, losing my mom last year, basically acting as a caretaker, that being my entire identity. I'm rediscovering myself. You have to rediscover yourself. You are not the you you were before that whatever tragedy happened. I'm a different person. Mm. Wow. You know, I am, I'm not. That person is gone. That me, the Miles, that tight whole identity that was tied into, you know, Northern Virginia, in many cases, was my whole life. Wow. I grew up out there now, and all my family is gone. My grandmother moved out, everybody. So one thing I've done too is just, I had to stay away from certain things that triggered all these emotions all the time. There's an incubus song called new skin. And I think that's very accurate, you know, to what's, what's talking about is the you that comes out at the end. The other side of it is not the same you. Mm. It's just not. Things that didn't happen 
you know, first off, so that, that's a problem. Right. But even if we're talking about accurate news, accurate news chooses sensational and scary things to tell us. Who considers it news, you know, that I drove to the office without incident, right? <laughs> it's not something that anybody needs to, to hear about. So we hear about scary things and we hear about bad things much more often than they occur, completely out of balance in terms of how often we hear about those things versus non-occurrences and, and safe, good outcomes. Yeah. And so yeah. that has the impact of dramatically skewing our, our perception of the likelihood of things. So this impacts things like our concern over something like being the victim of a, of a terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. That's frightening. It's a terrible thought. Extremely unlikely. You were far, far, far more likely to fall in your bathroom and mm. die from that than you are right. to, to be in a, in a terrorist attack. But no Nobody walks around fearing that, and, and it just has to do with the fact that you don't see constant news coverage of people falling in their own bathrooms at home. And so, um, this is, right. you know, so, th so this really turns our perception of risk on its head and, and makes it hmm. quite difficult when it comes to things that are risky but are not photogenic in, in a sense. So mm -hmm. something like medical errors is an example I use sometimes. Far more people are injured and, and even die as a result of medical errors than of something like car accidents or certainly terrorist attacks. And I think I think if you look at the stats, even, even gun violence is lower than medical errors. Mm -hmm. And most people don't know that. Most people don't feel fearful. It's just an example of where the amount of emotion and fear we have about something is a result of the discussion around it, the news coverage, not actual data. At the fundamental level, you know, we all engage in bias. This is actually something I've written about before. So, because you can seem overwhelming and you say, well, I can't go against Russia, I'm just an individual. Right. It's like, no, you can be nice to people on Facebook. You can actually think twice about what you just said in the comments on Twitter. You can actually, um, you can actually be the. A lot of times, people are really great people in in person, and right. then you put them in a digital environment. For some reason, this other side of that comes off. Turn it off, right? And when you see your friends doing it, ask them to stop. Right. You know. So imagine if we all just did that, we would, we would, man, would we decrease the volume? Wow. Right? Yeah. So we do. We really all can do something. I think that the biggest impediment is that when people uh, uh, fail at a task, they determine that that failure is a broad, instead of saying, um, it's like, again, my kids on a math test, <laughs> they get a bad grade on a math test and they can either say, I did bad on that test, on that concept, that's that piece of material, or they could say, I'm bad at math. Mm -hmm. I think that I think if right. you, people that are uh, confident recognize they they attribute they attribute um bad outcomes to either they were unprepared and they could have done more beforehand or it's just a one-off a bad day you know i was sick that day i didn't study as much as i should have or whatever blah 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 so i think uh i, I think that's the biggest impediment is that people overgeneralize um <clears throat> overgeneralize failure causes What do you want most for your life? Right now, I think it's joy. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know that we, I think given the current circumstances, always feel that joy. But yeah. um, I've learned through not practicing and, and uh, as an attorney in the last 10 years and all that, is that life is really lived in sort of um, what I call the mundane, right? The everyday mm -hmm. stuff. And that's really where the joy is. Um, yeah. You know, we can seek and, you know, the big things, the big accomplishments and, and all that. But right. when you look at sort of the everyday and you see, um, you know, your child smiling, uh, hugging your husband or yeah. spending time with family, having a good meal, you know, or drinking my coffee on the patio. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or whatever it is, those are the little things that bring joy. And when you can sort of look at all those and add them up, then I think you have a good life. I hope you enjoyed these ten lessons. What did you think? Did any of these resonate with you? Let me know in the comments below. Were there more lessons? 
Absolutely. Over the holidays, I want to invite you to look deeper into these interviews. Take some time, dig into them. I promise you, it won't be a waste of your time whatsoever. If you love to learn as much as I do, you will really, really enjoy them. In the meantime, I wish you all nothing but blessings over this holiday season. I love you all. See you next year.